Hello everyone, my name is Genia Schoenmansfeld and I'm Professor of Philosophy at the University of Southampton. In this video I'm going to talk about Wittgenstein and the meaning of religious language. And to start with, I'm going to give you a very brief outline of Wittgenstein's background and his life and works. Obviously, it's very difficult to do this in, in a short video, but I think um, it's, it's helpful to have a bit of a sense of who Wittgenstein was and what he did before we move on to a consideration of his conception of religious belief. So Wittgenstein was born in Vienna in 1889 and he died in Cambridge in 1951. He was the eighth and youngest child of a prominent and wealthy Austrian family of Jewish extraction. Wittgenstein was inspired to turn to philosophy by the works of the German philosopher Gottlob Frege and Bertrand Russell while studying aeronautics at Manchester. So philosophy wasn't actually his first port of call. Um, Wittgenstein started by studying engineering um, and therefore ended up doing aeronautics at Manchester where um, he started to read the works of Frege and in particular got mesmerized by the relationship between logic and mathematics. He's generally known to be the founder of two philosophies, the early and the later Wittgenstein. Now, Wittgenstein wrote much of his celebrated first work, the Tractatus Logico Philosophicus, while he was at the front in World War I, and he later finished it while a prisoner of war in Monte Cassino in Italy. And even though the Tractatus started off as a work on logic, on the relation between logic and the world, um, towards the end, he started to get very interested in mystical and religious questions. And he says in the notebooks, which can be taken as a preparatory study for the Tractatus, he says, my work has expanded from the foundations of logic to the essence of the world. And he also writes in a letter to his very close friend Ludwig von Ficke that the point of the Tractatus is ethical and that what he intends to do is to draw a limit to thought and to what is expressible by saying clearly what can be said and confining what is inexpressible to silence. Interestingly, Wittgenstein also inspired the logical positivists and the Vienna Circle, even though he was not a logical positivist himself. Now, in Wittgenstein's later work, we witness a very profound transformation. So in the early work, Wittgenstein was still ultimately grappling with traditional metaphysical questions. And even though tr the Tractatus aimed to bring metaphysics to an end, um, one can see the Tractatus itself as the last great metaphysical edifice. And what Wittgenstein tried to do in the Tractatus is to explain how language relates to the world. And he does this by creating um, a picture whereby propositions, thoughts, the sort of the, the basic meaning bearing constituents of language are to be viewed as pictures, as representing a state of affairs. So on his early view, language was like or similar to pictorial representation. In language, we present in words what we might otherwise paint in a picture. So propositions are in a sense like paintings. They depict a possible state of affairs. That's how Wittgenstein saw language in the early work. Now, 
in the later philosophy, Wittgenstein rejects much of what he thought was correct in his early view. So he rejects what is known as the picture theory of language, where propositions are supposed to depict or represent the facts in favour of a much more open ended um, and perhaps even commonsensical view of language. So I'm going to start today's more in-depth investigation by looking at what Wittgenstein's philosophical investigations have to say about word meaning, because that's going to be highly relevant to how we understand religious language. So in the investigations, Wittgenstein wants to disabuse us of the following. One, that the meaning of a word is the object it stands for. And two, that the meaning of a word is a private mental state. The second option is known as the Lockean theory of language that basically words name ideas in people's heads. And that's related to the first view that the meaning of a word is the object it stands for because generally speaking, you know, we can take object to mean two different things. We, we might think, you know, if a word means something, it refers to an object in the world. So, for example, table means table, chair means chair. But we could also think, as the British empiricists did, that the meaning of a word is an idea in someone's head. So the object that the word stands for is an idea in someone's head. Now, Wittgenstein rejects both of these views in favour of his famous later conception of word meaning, where he says, for a large class of cases, though not for all, in which we employ the word meaning, it can be defined thus, the meaning of a word is its use in the language. So what Wittgenstein is trying to do in the later work is to replace a conception of meaning where words mean particular objects and those objects themselves are what words mean in favour of a use conception of word meaning. So what words mean is basically determined by the role that individual words play in language as a whole. So language is is, is something that is used. And of course, not every use of a word is necessarily correct use. When Wittgenstein is talking about the meaning of a word is its use in the language, he of course means correct use. So how competent speakers use words, um, how they're defined in the Oxford English Dictionary and so on. But the use is, is the important thing. It's not, meaning is not constituted by particular objects that these words refer to. So on the later conception, words primarily refer to things in the world that are accessible to everyone. So Wittgenstein isn't rejecting the idea that words have reference, i.e. that words you know, name things in the world, because it's clearly a truth that words name things. What he is rejecting is the thought that those things themselves are what meaning consists in. So he rejects the idea that word meaning um, is exhausted by reference. So, you know, for example, if it were true that a word, say table, means table, where you know, literally the physical table is the word meaning, well, then it would be the case that if that table were destroyed, the meaning of the word would be destroyed at the same time. But of course, that's not the case. Words continue to mean something even if their reference no longer exists. And that wouldn't be true if those objects were themselves the meaning. Furthermore, Wittgenstein thinks we can have our own associations with words, 
but our own ideas or, or associations are not what the meaning of words consists in. Because if you know, our own ideas were the meaning of words, well, then it would be a mystery how we could understand each other in the first place. So if everyone's different association with a word were what the word meaning consisted in, well, then it wouldn't be obvious how I can understand the words you use at all. But the fact that we're all using a common language and we can understand each other implies that it cannot be the case that the meaning of a word is an idea in someone's mind. So Wittgenstein says, actually, I should like to say that the words you utter or what you think as you utter them are not what matters so much as the difference they make at various points in your life. How do I know that two people mean the same when each says he believes in God, practice, gives words their sense. So here we can already see a very clear connection between Wittgenstein's later conception of word meaning and its implications for religious language. So here Wittgenstein is suggesting, um, you know, the meaning of the word God is not determined um, exclusively by the referent, you know, whether there is some entity out there called God, but rather I get to learn what God means by seeing the difference that this word makes in the form of life that you've chosen. So if a religious believer says that they believe in God, then what this means is shown in the way in which this believer leads their life. So if their belief doesn't actually make any difference to their lives, if you know their life doesn't express the commitment that they allegedly have to God, well, then that would render it doubtful whether even though this person says they believe in God, they really do so. So how a belief shapes your life can tell you what belief is being picked out in the first place. So just as use makes a difference to word meaning, so practice makes a difference to the content of a belief. So now we can ask ourselves various questions. Um, in contemporary analytic philosophy of religion, you know, some people think the word God refers to a powerful superperson without a body. This, for example, is Richard Swinburne's definition. But Wittgenstein would reject that. Wittgenstein says the way you use the word God does not show whom you mean, but rather what you mean. And that's to say that on Wittgenstein's conception, the word God doesn't denote something, some entity that one could encounter independently of having the concept. So for Wittgenstein, there is a categorical difference between belief in God and belief in, say, a white unicorn or a belief in the great pumpkin. Um, because it would be possible to investigate whether there are such things, whereas Wittgenstein thinks it's not possible in a similar way to investigate whether there is a God. Um, the word God is not on a par with the word for you know, various outlandish entities. So Wittgenstein thinks there's a categorical difference between the word God and words referring to super powerful entities of some kind. So for Wittgenstein, God is not the name of a thing. And for that reason, as I've just said, one cannot launch an investigation in order to determine whether there is such a thing. I can't, for example, go up into space and try and find God. That would be a category mistake, a confusion. Furthermore, Wittgenstein thinks religious experiences, if there could be such things, are not like perceptual experiences. So I cannot perceive 
God in the way that I can perceive that someone else is in the room or that a computer is on the table and so on. So Wittgenstein wouldn't want to deny that, you know, religious experiences might be able to lead us to God, but those religious experiences are not perceptual experiences. There's no such thing as perceiving God to be around. At least I cannot use my perceptual capacities in order to perceive God. Um, if I use perceive in the case of God, um, I must be using perceive in a metaphorical sense. I cannot literally perceive God. And for that reason, Wittgenstein thinks religious experiences cannot act as evidence for the existence of God. I cannot infer the existence of God from those experiences, even though I myself might you know, have my belief inspired from such experiences. But these experiences are not independent evidence that someone else could use, for example, um, to show that there is a God. Furthermore, religious experiences are not self-validating um, or a form of evidence. So, so it's not that I couldn't disbelieve my own experience. It is possible for me you know, to, to write off a particular experience, whether I see that experience as a religious one is ultimately just down to myself. I, I can't appeal to any objective criteria that would, you know, establish once and for all that, you know, my experience was inspired by God. So there are no objective means of demonstrating, according to Wittgenstein, that God exists. Furthermore, Wittgenstein takes issue with cognitivists and non-cognitivists who think one can factorize religious language into a cognitive or a non-cognitive component. So, cognitivism is the view that religious language is just like ordinary fact-stating language, whereas non-cognitivism is the view that religious language is basically just emotive. It's just expressing an attitude to the world. It's not really um, doing anything, anything cognitive. It's not conveying facts. And Wittgenstein takes issue with both sides. He thinks religious language is neither obviously cognitive nor obviously non-cognitive. I can't factorize religious language into these different components. And furthermore, I can't understand what religious utterances mean just by trying to guess what the nouns in the religious sentences refer to. So just as we've seen in the quotation that we looked at earlier, we must pay attention to context and practice. We can only find out what a religious statement means if we see it in the, in the religious practice as a whole, if we understand what role it plays within a particular religious language game. A, a language game being a smaller component of language um, encapsulating a particular practice. And just to give you an example of how Wittgenstein thinks religious language works, Take the phrase, God's eye sees everything. Now, this sentence could be paraphrased as the deity has unlimited vision, but ultimately that's not really the role that this sentence plays in the life of religious believers. So if you insisted the cognitive content of the sentence, God's eye sees everything, is that the deity has a weird perceptual organ that is able to see everything around it, including stuff behind it, then you've not really understood what this sentence is saying. Because if we look at the role that this sentence plays in the life of religious believers, we're going to see that 
God's eye sees everything rather means something like God is constantly judging you. So it's not that God, you know, God has an eye that literally sees you all the time. It's rather um, that God is like a judge who, you know, is, is constantly subjecting you to moral criticism. So this shows that it's not easy to spell out, if you like, what the cognitive component of a religious sentence is, because in order to see what that sentence is saying, I can't just stay with the literal meaning. But neither does this imply that God's eye sees everything is non-cognitive, you know, that it doesn't express any idea. Because, of course, you know, if I paraphrase God's eye sees everything as God is constantly judging you, I'm, of course, still conveying a content. And it's perhaps helpful um, to understand what Wittgenstein is saying by comparing it to poetic language use. So on Wittgenstein's view, religious language, um, it's easier to see how religious language functions if we compare it to the way that aesthetic or artistic language works. So take Shakespeare's famous phrase, Juliet is the sun. Now, the literal paraphrasable meaning of this sentence is Juliet is a hot heavenly body. But of course, that's not really what the sentence is saying. Um, Romeo isn't saying Juliet is, is, you know, literally the sun. You know, the meaning of the sentence isn't the actual sun, as one might think on a referential theory of meaning. Rather, Romeo means something like Juliet is the centre of my universe or, you know, my whole life revolves around Juliet or something of the sort. And what this shows is that often what is essential to understanding a sentence is not given merely by its literal cognitive or paraphrasable content. So what Wittgenstein is basically proposing is that in order to understand religious utterances, I must understand the use to which religious pictures are put. So I must understand the role that religious pictures play in the life of the believer, in the use that the believer actually makes of such pictures. So just as Wittgenstein thinks um, meaning is use more generally, that applies even more to religious language, where if I think I can just stay at the literal paraphrasable level, well, then I'm often going to end up with incoherent paraphrases, like God's eye sees everything being paraphrasable as, you know, the deity has a bizarre perceptual faculty that can perceive everything. So if you like, According to Wittgenstein, religious doctrine only gives you the literal paraphrasable content. But if you want to understand what religious phrases really mean, you need to look beyond the literal and the paraphrasable. You need to understand the role that these words play within the life of a believer. And if you would like to read more about Wittgenstein on religious language. Um, I, I've written a book on, on Wittgenstein and Kierkegaard's conception of religion and philosophy um, in A Confusion of the Spheres, which has appeared with OUP. Um, have a look at this book if you would like further information about the themes I've discussed here today.